Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Our dear Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, the one who loved us and gave himself for us, we thank you, dear Lord, because you've called us unto yourself. We thank you, dear Lord, that you've adopted us and you've made us your own. We thank you, dear Lord, because you've united yourself to us and given us your Holy Spirit, that we might draw closer to you, that you would open our minds, that we would eventually become in your image from glory to glory. I pray for your work in this church. I pray, dear Lord, that your words would be mighty and powerful as a double-edged sword entering into our hearts, discerning between the soul and the spirit. I pray, dear Lord, that you would enlighten us, dear Lord, that we would be drawn to you and be desiring to carry out your will uh, day in and day out. I pray, dear Lord, for your blessings on this church, our fathers, the priests, and all who will come and attend here. Through the intercessions of St. Mary and all your saints who have pleased you since the beginning, hear us, dear Master, as we, your children, cry unto you with one voice, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. But deliver us from the evil one, through Christ Jesus our Lord. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Good morning. Here we are in the season of the Apostles' Fast, one of my favorite seasons. We talked about this a little bit last week. Lent was the season of reconciliation. We're celebrating what Christ did for us and drawing us to Himself. The season afterward, the Holy 50 Days, was a season of abiding with Christ. And we, we studied all the things He is to us. He is our bread. He is our life. He is our water. He is our light. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Then he goes up to heaven. He sends the Holy Spirit. But before he goes to heaven, he doesn't say just sit and wait around. He says, go and do something. Go and fulfill my will. This is the season of action. This is the season of kingdom building. And that's what the apostles did in this season. And it's the mission of this church. What is the mission of this church? One word. Transformation. Transformation. That is our goal. It was the mission of the early church. And that's what our desire is to be. To be like the early church. And we're using the first church as our model from the book of Acts. I would love to be a part of a church that has so many characteristics like the church had in that book. They demonstrated the mighty power of God through the Holy Spirit. We saw all through the book of Acts. We talked about last week how the lives of the people that were transformed really were attractive to the people who were not Christian. We saw that the church was expanding, that there was a beauty in the way they lived, that there was a union in the community and the way they worshipped. What's amazing was their ability to transform their world and turn it upside down. It was a church that set a trend to expand for generations to come. Again, the most important part of that kind of church was the work of God in the people. Without the Holy Spirit, there is nothing that anyone could do. It might be a great effort, but it won't be kingdom building. And so we decided that we were going to do the continuous prayer project. And I'm going to give you details. Father David and I, we might do a day in July, maybe July 11th. We're going to do a 24-hour day of prayer. We'll talk about that later. Last week we said the church would never expand if the people who became Christian, if their lives never changed. If they never went through anything new or greater, what would be the point of committing to something that would be so costly? We read from the documents in the first and second century, the letter to Diognetus and the letter to Hadrian, and what people from the outside said about them. He said, these are a people of their own. They have divine attributes. They have a love for all people. They have a level of morality that's higher than anything we've ever seen. And then we took the challenge last week of trying to live radically different than the people around us. Trying to have an experience inspired by our relationship with Christ to do something where someone might have the audacity to accuse you of being a follower of Christ. That was the challenge for last week. But this week I want to look at the community one more time. 
Because the church wasn't marked just by individuality. It wasn't just individuals who were changed. What was so special or eccentric about the church was the way that there were these communal characteristics. If there was ever a community that stood out as a shining bright light amidst darkness, it was definitely that one. So I wanted to look at some of the passages again in the book of Acts that talked about that community in Acts chapter 2 and chapter 4. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. In Acts chapter 2, verse 40. This is on the day of Pentecost. And with many other words he testified and he exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly. And continued steadfastly means there is a tremendous, tenacious, unwavering commitment to these things. What are these things? In the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. In the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together. And they had all things in common. They sold their possessions and their goods. They divided them among all as anyone had need. So, continually, so continuing daily with one accord, meaning fellowship, in the temple, which is prayer, and breaking bread, which is Eucharist, from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Then this small passage from chapter 4. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the, the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. And they distributed to each as anyone had need. I don't know if you saw a theme in those verses. There's several things that come up over and over. One of them it was clear. They were often in one accord. They were devoted to fellowship. They had all things in common. That there was some special intimacy that this group shared that is not really seen in many other groups in the history of the world. It wasn't a casual meeting of fellowship. It was the highest level of intimacy. Number two, it's clear that there was a sacrificial love in this community where they considered the needs of others first. Number three, it seemed like the word joy and gladness and rejoicing occurs over and over. That they were happy to do things together. Even if it meant sacrifice, they were happy to do it. So the fourth thing was prayer and worship. They prayed and worshiped with fellowship, with love, and with joy. People always say, well, what were the four things in the early church? The apostles' doctrine, the fellowship, the prayer, the breaking of bread. That unity and the way they lived their life had to be startling to everyone around them. I think that's the recipe for an incredible community. But when I examined it more, I realized a lot of it comes down to transformed relationships. That when Pentecost happened and the gospel was preached to them, I imagine relationships of that time were completely different. They took on this new character and this new face. And I'm going to look at a few of the passages in the Bible and we're going to talk about that. Uh, let me see if I have it here. No, I didn't include it. So I'm going to read it to you from Ephesians chapter 2. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For He Himself is our peace, who has made both one. He has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in His flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in Himself one new man from the two, thus making peace that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross 
Say that part again. That he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and those who were near. The bonds in the Jewish community were largely because of their history of being the church, or sorry, of being the chosen people of God. It was very tribal. It was very exclusive. You were either a Jew or you weren't a Jew. Like you were a Gentile. Like you had to be a Jew. Their relationships were very restrictive. Now you realize that Christ became the uniting factor in this passage. He abolished the wall of separation. There's no longer Jew or non-Jew. And He didn't come for a few. He tore down every single wall of separation between man and God and between man and everyone else. Nationality and culture didn't mean anything anymore. They weren't people of different nations, different languages, different cultures. They weren't separated by which soccer team or basketball team they followed. That didn't divide them. They were all now children of God. That was it. There was nothing else. Because all people are children of God. Now what I find in the church is oftentimes this Jewish mentality. That we are the chosen people. That God came to save the Copts. And God wants to bless us, and He wants to take us into His kingdom. And everyone else, they're probably just evil and unholy, because they're not part of us. And if they find us, we say, okay, good for them. What we're forgetting, though, in the passage of the Ephesians, when He says, you who once were afar off, you want to know who He's talking to? He's talking to you. You are the far off. You are not the center. You were somehow brought near by Christ. You're not Jewish, but you were allowed to become a part of this group. Based on what qualification? Christ's cross. That God created you. That Christ became our peace. He is our ticket in. And He presents the same ticket, not just to the people of Egypt, but to everyone. It only makes sense that we're accepted not based on our qualifications, but God's great love, then we need to have the same mentality towards everyone else. At that point, Christ established the very first all-inclusive destination. It started in the church, not with Marriott, not with Hilton. Now, I wanted to kind of put this into perspective. You know, when people came into the church, they were believers, they became part of one body. No body ever hated itself, as St. Paul says. So one has to wonder, if there is a wall of separation between any of us, are we really in Christ? That before Christ, there may have been things that separated people. But Christ is our peace. He's the one that reconciled us to God and with all people. See, Christ didn't decide to establish a kingdom for a few. He decided to establish it for everyone. To put this into perspective for those people that time, Jews and Samaritans. Samaritans were considered dogs. Not the cute, little, cuddly, puppy, schnauzer type. Like dogs. Like it was as derogatory as could be. The ugly, dirty kind. They had mixed Judaism with other religions. They were no longer completely true to the Old Testament faith. So that's why they were despised. And it's shocking that Christ would be so bold as to walk into Samaria and talk to a sinful Samaritan person. The cultural barriers were deep-seated and hatred. But before Christ leaves, He says what? I want you to go preach in Jerusalem and Judea go around Samaria, then go back. No, he says, go to Samaria. Christ was saying, I want you to go to the people that you call dogs. And then go beyond that. Go to the ends of the earth. They were accepted into the family of God. And if you think about that, their past had to have been forgotten. As terrible as their history was, 
As they disobeyed God, they had strange customs and practices, but they were no longer seen as outsiders. They were transformed in the same body, united to each other through the same cross. Christ was our peace. If they accepted the cross of Christ, Samaritans were no longer dogs. They didn't say, come here, dog, in church. What did they say? Come here, brother. Come here, sister. That is a complete transformation in the way they related to each other. You ordinarily don't just call anyone brother. There has to be a sense of commonality, um, of sharing, of intimacy. So the Jews, they were supposed to accept the Samaritans and the Gentiles. That sounds crazy. Even women were supposed to be accepted. You're thinking, where is the line going to be drawn, right? Greeks, barbarians, slaves, slave owners together in the same church. Accepted as brethren. There's a verse in the Bible that I understood most of this verse for the longest time. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, I got that, Jews and Gentiles, circumcised nor uncircumcised, same thing, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. I know what barbarian means. I know what slave means. I know what free means. I had no idea what Scythian means. I read it so many times. There is a historian named Herodotus, and he wrote a description of the Scythians. This is what he said about these people. A grace of savages. I don't know if that was to put it politely. Inhabiting a region of rather indefinite boundaries, north of the Black and Caspian Seas and the Caucasus Mountains. They were nomads who neither plowed nor sowed. They moved about in wagons, carrying their dwellings with them. They had the most filthy habits and never washed in water. They drank the blood of the first enemy killed in battle. They made napkins of the scalps and drinking bowls of the skulls of the slain. Their deities were many of them identified with those of the Greeks, but the most characteristic rite was the worship of the naked sword. And they sacrificed every hundredth man taken in war to this deity. War was their chief business and they were a terrible scourge to the nations of Western Asia. Now let's go back. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor circumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. I have no idea how I would have felt towards a Scythian. To have them stand next to me in church would have been pretty startling. But there's another story in the book of Acts. It's pretty interesting. I mean, if you think about it, anyone could join the community. Anyone. Despite their past, their reputation, their appearance, their customs. They're members of the body of Christ. In Acts chapter 9, there's an incredible example of this. There's a man named Saul. He's got a decree. Put the Christians to death. Put them all in prison. doesn't matter if you have to kill them. Whatever we have to do to stop the spread of Christianity, do it. That was his life purpose. That was his goal. Everyone was hearing about this Saul person. And they were rightfully afraid of Saul. Even after he gets converted, the apostles couldn't believe it. Such a terrible man... And now he's coming to Damascus with decrees. He gets converted on the way, so God tells this other person, Ananias. Ananias, while he's praying to him, well, Ananias is praying, God speaks to him, which I think is very cool. And then Ananias' response is, here I am, which is a great response. If God ever talks to you in your prayer, say, here I am. Then he says, what do you want me to do for you, Lord? Wonderful way to talk to God. He says this, I want you to go and I want you to talk to Saul. I want you to take him into your house. There's a bit of hesitation you could imagine on the part of Ananias. Lord, I've heard about this man. I've heard about all the harm he's done. I've heard how he's coming here with authority to do the same thing. Could you imagine what it would be like to go and speak to the Hitler of the Christians? 
Say, I want you to go and talk to him. I want you to have him stay in your house. I know he hates, or at least he did before, he hates you, hated you, and your people. Yeah, okay, I want you to go get him. So what does Ananias do? God explains a little bit to Ananias, and he said, first thing he says to Saul when Ananias finally arrives at the house, he looks at the man, this cold-blooded murderer, he separates families, he imprisons people, he previously hated you and your kind, and the first thing he says to him is, brother. Go read the passage. He calls this ex-murderer, this racist person, brother. It didn't matter what he was. All that matters is what he now is. In Christ, those were all erased. That's the grace of God. I'll tell you one more story. Because when I heard this story, it blew my mind. It's a story of a South African woman. When Mandela, Nelson Mandela came back to power, he gave the opportunity to some of the officers that if they wanted to maintain their positions, they had to confess. And then he would reinstate them of the things they did. At this trial, this woman went, and she wanted to hear what was being said. She went because he was the one that made her husband and son victims. So at the trial, she asked him, what did you do with my husband? He said, well, he was out after curfew. So we arrested him, we tied him to a stake, and we burned him till he died. And then we buried him. She said, well, what did you do to my son? He was out after curfew. We arrested him. We tied him to a stake. And we burned him till he died. And we buried him. That's pretty incredible to hear. So she says, I have two requests. Number one, I want you to tell me where you buried them. They're my family. They deserve an appropriate burial. And number two, I'm a Christian woman, and I had a son, and I don't have a son, and I still need someone to love. So I want you to come, and I want you to have dinner with me every day, because you are now going to be my son. And then all the women that were with her, the Christian women, began to sing the song, Amazing Grace. To me, that's the testimony of the way someone looks at relationships completely differently than anyone had ever seen it before. So after I heard that story and I began to think, could we accept someone who persecuted our church? Let's say one of the ISIS members who earlier this year had been one of the assassins of the 21 Coptic youth. How would we treat them had they walked through those doors? How would you deal with someone who hated you, who had murdered someone close to you, if they could do it back in those days, and people are still doing it now, could we accept anyone who walks through those doors, even if they're not Egyptian? Hopefully, they'll feel it's okay. What if they were someone who had strange hair, like straight? Um, what if they had tattoos all over their body, or nose rings? Or what if they were former drug addicts or unclean homeless person? What if they were someone who had been through a divorce or committed adultery? What if they were transgender? What if they were fans of LeBron James? Could we accept them into this church? Is it possible? I wonder. So what is our problem? Our problem is we've forgotten who we are without Christ. Our evil thoughts, our evil intentions... The lies, the deceit, the lust, the greed, you name it. We're not so hot without Christ. But with Christ, we're a new creation. Rehabilitated. We're works in progress.
covered by the grace and mercy of God, we are what we are. If you remember that God accepted the likes of you, then you should accept anyone into this church. Not only that, but we should treat them as brother and sister in Christ. So some things I wanted to say about relationships. Back then, their relationships were all inclusive. They accepted anyone. There's this quote by Elder Epiphanius, which is one of the best quotes I've ever heard. My, art, my heart only has entrances. It doesn't have exits. Whoever enters remains there. Whatever he may do, I love him the same as I loved him when he first entered into my heart. I pray for him and seek his salvation. Could you imagine what the church would be like that the moment you first met someone, you embraced them, that you never let them go? Could we be all inclusive? Number two, I believe that they had a new perspective in the way they looked at people. They looked at people in Christ's eyes. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 to 19. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. He's given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to Himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. The goal is not to condemn, but the goal is to reconcile. It says, it was in Christ Jesus. He reconciled everyone to Himself. Our job is to facilitate that. They're new creations. So, number one, their relationships were all inclusive. Number two, they had a new perspective. They forgot your past. What happened before didn't matter. It didn't matter what St. Paul had done. He would never have been who he was if everyone held his old sins against him. St. Moses the Strong would never have been who he was if he was always held accountable for his past before Christ. And the third one is the concept of brother. It wasn't this distant, insincere love. It's not like where you were so superficial, you say, oh, did you watch the game last night? Or how's your portfolio? Or where did you go on vacation? Um, it's more like I'm my brother's keeper. For those of you who are the older sibling, or even if you're the younger one, maybe you can appreciate the older one being your brother's keeper. You know what a responsibility it is to look at someone who is in need, who is immature, who doesn't really know how to get through things. They didn't have the experience you did. Someone had to introduce them to deodorant before their classmates did. Someone had to have the talk with them before their parents did so that they didn't all join monasteries. It was a responsibility that kind of like this picture. Sometimes being a brother is even better than being a superhero. I don't know if you can read this. It says, brother and sister together as friends, ready to face whatever life sends, joy and laughter or tears and strife, holding hands tightly as we dance through life. Your relationship with your siblings oftentimes are stronger than that with your parents. Your relationship will likely be longer. Your parents will probably leave before your siblings do. And that is something that is very difficult to break. Every once in a while, I get a text or an email or on a phone and someone says, thank you, brother. That is one of the most endearing terms you could use to call someone sister or brother. But what if you began to be sister or brother to others? So their relationships were all inclusive. They were done with a new perspective, forgetting the past of the individual. They had this concept of brother, 
And then there was this other thing called hospitality. Sorry, before that. Their last thing I want to say before hospitality is their relationships were constantly expanding. A lot of us have our inner circles. We might have our small group of friends or our community groups, whoever. And I think you need to have your super, super close friends close to you. But even that can be exclusive. The church will never grow if we're always looking to those close to us. What I read to you last week, where they were looking for strangers to bring them into their homes to call them brother. They were constantly looking for opportunities to love more people. You can't say, well, I've got enough. You can have enough of your close circle of friends. You don't need to have 200 close friends. But you need to have enough love for everybody. Everybody. And number five is hospitality. One of the greatest verses in the book of Hebrews. I love this. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing some have unwittingly entertained angels. I expect if you learn this verse, my social calendar to explode after this. But I've seen converts come into the church. They're not Egyptian. They come and people say hi to them at church, but they don't invite them to their house when it's Thanksgiving or Christmas or something big. They say, you're our token convert. Yay, we're happy to have you at church. But are we so happy to have them so close to us that they are in our families, they're in our hearts? And that hospitality that was in that first and second century was insurmountable. I don't know how we could just go and ask strangers to be in our homes. Every once in a while, I hear of people who do it. And it's amazing. I gotta tell you, the day that we accept everyone that comes through those doors and treat them as brothers is the day that this church really begins to be transformed. Something that we read every day in the book of hours how pleased will God be when He sees brethren to dwell together in unity? You might be aware of this, and they've done studies on this, but one of the most common reasons why people join a church is for social reasons. And you know what? I don't blame them. They should want to come to this church for social reasons. It's the beauty of the Christian church. If we are one body, if we value every member, if we do really, truly do treat people like brothers and sisters, I can't get that in most places. I can't buy a membership hardly anywhere that would give me that. Not even in Costco. And they don't come, or sorry, they don't leave the church for just any reason. Most people leave the church not because the sermons are long, because you guys are used to that now. It's not because the coffee is inadequate. It's because people did not embrace them. This Christian community that we keep talking about in church. If people leave, it's not because of this. It's because of this. And that's our responsibility. It's interesting. I've seen people that come to the church, they're baptized in the community, they worship in the community, they partake of the same body and the same blood, they're united by the blood of Christ, but they feel like they're outsiders. And that shouldn't happen. We have to restore this new type of relationship. So, I'm coming down to the end here. If we could all adopt this mentality, I think we would all be happy. People would start looking at our church, they might start even talking about our church. People might join, and they might never leave. Here it is. Are you ready? We're on our way, if we can do this one thing. I want us to now be like the father of the prodigal son. Because what did he do? When he was still a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck, and kissed him. Despite the shame, the humiliation, the wastefulness, the rejection, the Father embraced him. I am now ordaining you as all fathers of the prodigal children. You need to all be like this. That when you see someone come through those doors who you don't know, or even if you do know them, 
even if you know the negative things about them, we still need to be this person. We need to embrace people as loving fathers, brothers, and sisters. You don't have to hug everyone. We're not all huggers. But a joyful greeting would be nice. Genuine concern about the lives of every individual. A sense that you're happy that they're among you, overlooking the past. It's the kind of thing that a brother would do to a brother or a sister. Could we do that? Could we transform our relationships this week? Could you call someone this week? Could you meet someone new this week? Could you ask about someone that's going through something difficult? I get calls all the time. Mark, what do we do? This person has cancer. I bet almost every single person in here knows someone who is dying of cancer. There are people that are not just dying of illness, but there are people going through economic hardships. They're having difficulty with their kids, difficulties with their marriages, difficulty with depression. They may have suffered a loss of a loved one. I know that if you had a brother or sister with any of the conditions that I just mentioned, you would invest your lives in those people, wouldn't you? Be loving mothers and fathers, be brothers and sisters, just be family. We want to have transformed relationships in this church. So that's your challenge for the week, transform relationships. It will only happen by the grace of God and His Spirit working in the life of each individual. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. My dear Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, with your good Father and the Holy Spirit, we stand before you in awe of your greatness of the amazing things that you've done in reconciling us to yourself, we who were so far off, most, of us, most people would have looked at us and said, I don't want to come here, but you didn't hesitate. I thank you, dear Lord, that despite all our weaknesses, despite all our sins, you embraced us, the undeserving. I pray, dear Lord, that you could pour that love in our hearts that you showed us, I pray, dear Lord, that you would expand our hearts, expand them so wide that we could embrace everyone, regardless of where they come from, what they look like, what they do, or what they've done in the past. I know, dear Lord, that requires a lot of changing our mentality, a lot of changing our minds, a lot of removing the pride and the ego and the, the anger, the hatred, the selfishness that we carry around. I pray, dear Lord, that you would work in us, from image to image, from glory to glory, that you would transform us. I pray, dear Lord, that you would teach us and help us to, Lord, as closer we are embraced by you, that we should be embracing everyone as brother. I thank you for your great mercy, your great loving kindness, and your blessings poured upon each and every one of us. I pray, dear Lord, that you would use us as your vessels, as your messengers, to give us this ministry of reconciliation, that we would draw all people to you. I thank you, dear Lord, and I praise you and I glorify you. The intercessions and prayers of St. Mary, all your angels, all your saints, everyone who has loved you ever since the beginning, we cry out with them and together in one voice saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please.